Chancellor, I have the pleasure to request Dr. Chai Tindin to address the congregation. Chancellor, academic staff, graduates, and parents. If we are to live in a proud society, in a society where we are proud of our natural resources, of our wildlife heritage, and want to have a proud legacy, we have not only to, to look after our rapidly declining rhinoceros population, we also have to look after the smaller organisms the, 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 the rare and endangered species and endangered plants so that we can turn to our children and grandchildren and say to them, we have done our best to conserve these organisms. Now it is your turn, see what you can do about it. You will know that there is a very fine balance between predator and prey in the natural world. And it's the much, much the same with human beings, where you have those that exploit our natural resources and those that try to conserve our natural resources. Now, there are three groups, three main groups, that exploit our natural resources. There are those that utilize our wildlife for monetary gain, and that is what is happening with our rhino population at the moment. And then there is a group that utilizes natural resources for, for, uh, for pleasure, and in there I would include the hunters, and the fishermen, etc. And then the third group that utilize our natural resources for food. On the right side, we have the conservationists. And there again, there are three main groups you have the casual naturalist, the person who has an interest in wildlife, likes to take a stroll in the walk in the grass, or perhaps visit the game reserve every now and again. And you have a second group which likes to delve into it a little bit further, has an interest in wildlife, and also likes to publish their findings. And where they see things going wrong, um, to to make a, a, a noise about it and uh, to protest about what is going on. And the third group would be um, professional conservationists. And there are not many positions um, in this province for professional um, conservationists. So we all can't be or work in the world of conservation, but we can get involved and publish. And those of you who have graduated, I urge you to continue to publish in your life and publish again and be vocal. When you see things are going wrong in the natural world, don't keep quiet about it. Between the two groups of those who exploit our natural resources and those who try to conserve, sit the lawmakers. And very often the lawmakers don't sit up and do something about uh, the problem that arises unless there is a very vocal voice, unless people are vocal, stand up and say, things are not right here, we should be doing something about this. Now I want to give you a few examples of an area where I see things going wrong in the ornithological world, my, my area of expertise. And I'm going to use a couple of examples here. Firstly, let's take a look at the sand grouse situation in this country. Now, sand grouse are small game birds, about the size of a dove, and they don't occur really in the eastern areas. They are a western species. And these birds are drinkers. They need to drink water every single day of their lives, or at least every second day. And they fly long distances. They fly up to 40 to 50 kilometers in a day to drink water. Now, these small game birds, 
are also used for hunting. They are on the hunter's list. So hunters use them during the hunting season and there are not only local hunters that hunt them, but there are also overseas people who visit this country and hunt sand grass. Now, the method of hunting is to get into dugouts close to water sources and shoot the birds when they come in to drink, and they drink regularly between about 9 o'clock in the morning and about half past 10. Now, during the breeding season, the birds, the male birds, have this ability to carry water to their, to their young. And so they dive in, have a quick drink of water, soak their belly feathers, and then fly off and go and allow the chicks to drink. The, chick, the chicks waddle up to them and are able to suck on their specially adapted belly feathers and drink. Now the hunting season is between March and July. And the hunters will tell you that that isn't during the breeding season. But we as ornithologists know there are many sand grass that breed during this period. And I ask the question, why are we allowing this? Why are we allowing hunters to shoot sand grass close to their water sources? Why are we allowing hunters to shoot sand grass at all in this day and age? Now moving to the eastern areas, I want to give you another example. In the Kruger National Park, the pride and joy of this country, there are thousands and thousands of European nightjars that visit Southern Africa, and of course they are present in fair numbers in the Kruger National Park. Now hundreds and hundreds of these birds are getting killed during the summer months when they are here. And let me tell you that these birds fly long distances. They fly from Europe to utilize our insect resources here during the summer months. There are birds that fly from Siberia, and even a population, a race that flies from Mongolia. Now these birds, as I said, are being killed in their hundreds at night time by the service delivery vehicles in the Kruger National Park. My wife and I, when we visit the park on a fairly regular basis, we pick up dead birds in fair numbers in the early mornings, nightjars killed by service delivery vehicles. Now that just isn't good enough. We've got to do something about this, and it's no good keeping quiet about it. And I urge you, if you go to places like a Kruger Park and you see that sort of thing, you've got to be vocal about it. You've got to publish this sort of thing so that the lawmakers sit up and take note of what is going on. And we intend to take this further. We're not going to keep quiet about it, obviously. Now I want to turn to a, a different sort of problem in the eastern areas of southern Africa where you have high populations of people and demand for land and you have the conservationists on the other hand that want to um, see to the conservation of multiple diverse natural habitats. Now if you look at the St. Lucia system, Lake St. Lucia system, during the 1950s and the 1960s, the then government decided that that would be a good idea for forestry. And amongst other species, they planted a lot of pine trees. Now let me tell you that pine trees don't actually do all that well in those lowland grassland areas that surround the lake. And Lake St. Lucia, being the, 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 the ecosystem that it is, should have been one of the first areas that we should have conserved in KwaZulu-Natal. There are three bird species that were first described from the Durban Harbour area over a hundred years ago. They are black kukul, swamp nightjar, and rosy-throated longclaw, all of them fairly rare species. And all of them really don't even occur in the lowland eastern areas of KwaZulu-Natal anymore because that whole area was taken up by sugarcane. Now we let those species down. We should have conserved, when I say we, I'm talking about 50 or 100 years ago, we should have conserved a block of land just north of Durban somewhere where those sort of species that need lowland grassland could have had a home. Now you may recall during the 1980s, the 
outcry by citizens of this province and this country and the conservationists that tackled government on this and eventually won the day. And Lake St. Lucia, fortunately, has been converted back to a conservation area. And this is now the core breeding area for those three species that I've just mentioned. Thank goodness for them. Those that conserved that region around St. Lucia, because those birds have now the opportunity to su survive in this province and perhaps even expand in their population. And there are many other problem areas in Southern Africa in bird life. There are rare species that we need to look after. One of those species would be the little um, bar African barred owlet, the nominate race that occurs in the Eastern race. Now there are only a few of those birds left in the country. We need to do something about it and look after those, um, that particular race of, of barred owlet. And if you want your children to see Cape parrots in the future, and you have an interest in wildlife, you need to get involved, you need to, to help monitor the species, and you need to join the outcry against the wild bird cage industry. And in closing, I would just like to say, we should have done a better job with conserving species like rhino, and I hope that that problem is resolved in the near future. But we also need to look after the smaller organisms, the rarer birds, the rarer plant species. And those of you who have an interest in wildlife, I urge you to publish. Don't just because you've got your degree now to stop publishing, go out there and publish and publish again and make your voice heard, be vocal so that the lawmakers in this country sit up and listen to what we've got to say. Thank you very much.